Welcome to the copywriting course. Now, I absolutely love copywriting. I think it is one of the most underrated business skills in existence. So what is copywriting? Copywriting is salesmanship in print. It's using your words to sell something. And you've actually seen copywriting multiple times on a daily basis. Any email that is trying to get you to take an action is a form of copywriting. Billboards, that's copywriting. Landing pages for websites, especially startups or software as a service companies, that's all copywriting. Brochures, that's a lot of copywriting there too. So the key point about copywriting is it's writing that is designed to make someone take an action. And this was actually really popular in the 1960s when people would do direct mail campaigns. So they would write sales letters, mail these sales letters off to thousands of people, and those people would purchase the products based on the quality of the sales letter. So originally copywriting sole purpose was to exchange money. But with the internet, salesmanship in print has grown tremendously, or copywriting. And what I mean by this is a lot of times you get emails that ask you to sign up for another email list, but they're not asking you for money. So the definition of copywriting has evolved, and now it's writing that is designed to make someone take an action. And actually, you're going to notice this a lot if you go on websites. They almost always capture your email before they try and sell you something. And that's because once they get your email address, then they can use copywriting to sell their product to you. And once they have your email, they can contact you anytime they want, and it's really easy for them to do so. So why would you want to learn copywriting? <laughs> There's so many reasons. You can literally apply it everywhere. It actually helps you develop a customer-focused mindset. So the whole lesson that copywriting really revolves around is people don't care about you, they care about themselves. And I know this can sound kind of pessimistic, but it's really important. And if we understand this, we can actually use this to our advantage. So people are always looking for what's in it for them. Just because you think something is great doesn't mean your customer is going to think it's great either. It only is going to be great to your customer if they see how it can directly benefit their life. And when you learn copywriting, it's like delivering your best sales pitch thousands of times. So let's say you're a really good salesperson and you're working at a car dealership. You can only pitch to around 30 to 50 people a day. But if you're an excellent copywriter, you only have to write your sales letter once and it can be distributed all over the internet thousands of times through emails, you could do a direct mail campaign, and that's actually still really effective. But the point is, once you write your sales letter once, that's it. You don't have to pitch again. You've already written down your sales pitch and now you can just send it out. And with the power of the internet, there has never been a better time to learn copywriting. And as you can imagine, there is a huge demand for people with copywriting skills. Businesses are recognizing that they need words that help other people take an action. And not only is the business to consumer market really needing copywriting skills, but actually the business to business market really needs copywriting skills as well. And there's a huge amount of people that have become freelance commercial copywriters and they're making a ton of money every year by writing copy for business to business sales. So sorry if I got a little overwhelmed or I overwhelmed you a little bit, but I really just think copywriting is an awesome skill. And if you learn it now, it's going to pay dividends your entire life. And if you're currently running a business and you're trying to sell more product, copywriting is going to directly help you make sales. And just as a little tidbit, one example, and there's many, of great copywriting is there was an ad. And the ad did decently well. It made some sales. But all they did was change the headline of the ad and they increased the sales by five times. So that's 500% increase in sales just by changing the words. So your words are very powerful. 
And in this course, you're going to learn exactly how to use those words to your advantage. So in this lecture, I want to point out to you that copywriting is everywhere. And I want to show you that you really do see copywriting all the time throughout your typical day. So billboards. Right here we have a great example of copy. So the important thing here is just another refreshing day in paradise. And that's what we call a headline in copywriting. And that's to get your attention. Now in this example, this billboard is to reinforce the brand of Coca-Cola. But our headlines can serve whatever purpose we choose to serve. And we're going to talk about that in a later lecture in this course. Now here's an example of a landing page on a website. And here we have a headline, Powerful Social Media Software. And we also have a subheadline, which is right below it, a management and engagement platform for social business. And then we have our call to action, which is the green button, start your free trial. So there's a lot of aspects of copywriting just in this single landing page. And I'm going to go over all of these different aspects as we go through this course. But I just want you to notice that all of these copywriting factors come into play in so many different places. Or just an email to a friend or anyone. When you're writing emails, your copywriting skills come into play. And anytime you're convincing someone to take an action. So even if you want to invite a group of your friends to go to a movie, if you know copywriting, you're actually more likely to get them to go to a movie with you. Because you're seeing things from their perspective. You're seeing what do they get out of it. So let's get started. So now I'm going to talk about how this course is structured. Now this course is broken up into six different sections. And right now you're in the first section, which is the introduction. After the introduction, I'm going to move into philosophy. And philosophy is extremely important in copywriting. And it has to do with what I mentioned earlier, which is customers don't care about you, they care about themselves. But there's also a lot of other factors of philosophy that go behind copywriting. And when you learn these philosophies, you're going to see a lot of the world in a completely different way. And it's going to be really empowering for you. After we talk about the philosophy behind copywriting, we're going to go over headlines. And this is what makes an effective headline. Now when it comes to copywriting, your headline is actually more important than your body copy. And that's because if your headline doesn't grab your reader's attention, then the rest of your words are pointless because they're not going to click to check it out. And actually, most of the famous copywriters spend more time writing a great headline than they do writing the entire body copy. So that's going to be a really interesting section for you. And after we talk about headlines, we're going to get into body copy. And even though body copy isn't as important as headlines, it's still really important. And you're going to learn how to write effective body copy. And we're going to start out that section by talking about ADA, which is a sales formula that once you learn about it, you're going to see it everywhere. After body copy, we're going to get into technical stuff, which is just how to format your copy to make it more readable. And finally, we'll get to the conclusion where we'll review everything we've learned and I'll point you to some really great resources if you want to continue learning more about copywriting. So now we're going to get started with philosophy behind great copywriting. And the first point, which I've already mentioned a couple times, is people truly care about themselves. No one cares about you. They care about what you can do for them. Now, I'm not talking about loved ones. Obviously, they care about you. But I'm talking about the people that are going to be reading your copy. They want to know what's in it for them. And as an example, do you pay attention to who writes the articles you read? Or do you read an article because you're really interested in the information being offered? So I'm going to take two examples here to illustrate this point. So this is typical business writing that I'm sure you've seen something like this before. Our business has been serving people for over 20 years. We started as a small independent wholesaler and now we have over 400 clients. Our excellent commitment to service has led us to ship higher quality products than our competitors. And I see writing like this all the time. But if you take a second to look back at this paragraph, if I want to do business, 
with whichever business wrote this paragraph? What's in it for me? I don't see anything about me. It's all about how their business has been successful, how they have over 400 clients. And it really doesn't grab my attention. I don't think they can solve my problem. So if we were to rewrite this, it could be something like, are you tired of wholesalers that don't deliver what they promise? Do you feel like your needs are being neglected? We have built our business around customer service, which means you will never wait more than 24 hours to receive a delivery. So here, we've just done some minor alterations to this paragraph, and now it's all about me and how this business is gonna directly benefit my business. So as you can see, using that mindset that people only care about themselves is really effective. So now we're gonna talk about the importance of really getting to know your customers or your readers. And the main thing is we wanna stop the guessing. So assumptions are dangerous. Whenever we assume that we know what our customer wants and we don't enforce it by interviewing customers, then that assumption is really hurting us because we could be writing copy that doesn't apply to the people reading it. So, so often we think that because we see the world one way, everyone else sees it the same way, but that's simply not true. Everyone sees a different world and the only way to really know what your customers are thinking is to talk to them. So it's really important to interview your customers. And in customer interviews, not only do you want to directly talk to them, but you want to identify their pain points. So these are the things that are frustrating them. Also, whenever you're doing a customer interview, you don't want to try and sell them anything. And you don't want to bring up your solution because you might get a softball answer where they'll say they'll use it, but they're not actually willing to pay for it. So in these customer interviews, you're really just interested in listening and discovering what their pain points are. And pain points is another word for their problems. And not only do you want to do this, but you want to interview multiple customers. And that's because you want to get different perspectives. And the more customers you interview, the more perspectives you'll get. But what typically happens is if you interview enough customers, you're going to notice a form of commonality between all the customers, and it's going to be a common pain that they all share. And that's what you want to address in your copy. But before we can even write any copy, we have to know what that pain point is. And we can't guess. We really just have to talk to customers to figure it out. Now. This is a pretty time intensive process. And if you're just writing copy for an email to a friend, then this won't apply to you. But if you're writing copy for a product that your business has been working on for a long time, then doing this research is worth it because it's gonna help you write much more effective copy that's gonna help you sell many more products. In this video, we're gonna be talking about your central selling idea. So before we write any piece of copy, we want to be clear about the offer that we're making. And that's because although copywriting is very effective, if we don't have a good offer, then it's still going to be hard to get people to take an action. So an offer can be anything, but you want to make sure that you're very clear about what your offer is. So let's say, for example, that you want someone to sign up for your email list. So your offer might be if they sign up for my email list and give me their email, then I'm going to give them an ebook that tells them how to make a cheap WordPress blog. So before I've even written any of this copy, I have a clear idea that my offer is they give me their email and I'll give them an ebook that tells them how to create a WordPress blog. So your offer can be anything, but it's just important that you know what it is and it's simple so you understand it before you start writing copy. And just like I said, it's that one message that you're communicating to your customer. So here's an example of a CSI or a central selling idea that's not clear. By taking this course, you will write better, you will think better, and you'll have more success. Now that's pretty vague. I don't really know what I'm offering here. And I'm sure that my customer or my reader doesn't know what I'm offering. 
So it's always, it kind of sounds like common sense, but it's actually really easy to forget this, where we have a general idea of what we're offering, but we're not really clear about it. So it really helps you out if you can write your central selling idea in a single sentence. So for example, by taking this course, you will learn how to become a more effective writer in less than two hours. So I'm clear about what my offer is. Now I can even make this more clear by saying what the other person is offering. So give me a hundred dollars and I will teach you how to become a more effective writer in less than two hours. But in this case, I don't know how much I'm going to charge yet. So it's okay that I'm just focusing on what I'm delivering. But if you know what you want to get in return from your customer, then you can make your central selling idea even more clear. In this video, we're going to talk about the importance of talking to one person. So even though your copywriting might be read by thousands of people, each time someone reads your copywriting, you're speaking to one single person. So you always want to keep that in mind. So when you write your copy, it's not targeted at thousands of people. It's targeted at one single person. So just like I said, this is speaking to a single person and it's not a speech. It's not as if you were giving the sales pitch in front of 20 people. It's more so that you're giving a sales pitch to a single person. And a great way to keep this mindset when you're writing your copy is to create a persona of a typical customer and then speak directly to them through writing. So what is a persona? A persona is a fictional character that's based off the traits that your target market has. So your persona should be representative of your target market. And if you don't know what your target market is, then you're going to want to do more customer interviews. But there is no exact science to making a persona, so you're going to have to guess, but you want your guesses to be educated. So instead of making guesses that you just assume your typical customer will be like, you want to base them off the information you got from your customer interviews. So here's an example of a persona. I found this picture off a Google image search and I've named this guy Bob Thompson and I've decided that he's 52 years old and he's married with two children. His job is a financial analyst at EY. He loves do-it-yourself projects and hobby businesses and he's scared of not being able to provide for his family. So I never interviewed someone named Bob Thompson who was a financial analyst at EY and who loves do-it-yourself projects and hobby businesses. But let's say for this example, I interviewed 20 different people and they all seem to be similar to this persona. So if I'm writing directly to Bob, then the rest of my target market is going to respond and feel like I'm writing directly to them. Now I'm not going to include Bob's name in the writing because it's fictitious or not real, but I still want to keep Bob in mind when I'm writing my copy. What would Bob think about what I'm writing right now? So this is really a mental exercise that really just helps you write your copy in a more focused way that'll help your target market. In this video, we're going to talk about the importance of getting your customer to take an action. So copywriting or copy has one goal and your single goal in any piece of copy is to get your customer or your reader to take an action. And that action can be as simple as signing up for an email list, ordering your product, or maybe calling a salesperson. So it doesn't matter what you choose your action to be, but what does matter is that your copy is leading your reader to take that action. So all of your copy is helping you towards that goal. Otherwise, you can get rid of it. So if it's not helping your customer or help convince your customer to take that action, then consider eliminating it from your copy. And that's because you want your copy to be effective. You want it to be long enough where you can explain why your reader should take the action, but you don't want it to have excess fluff that your reader finds boring or distracting and that might cause them not to take you the action. So some examples of this are, have you seen a commercial that you thought was really clever, but it didn't make you want the product? 
So I've seen this a couple of times where companies will spend who knows how much money. It could be tens of thousands of dollars creating these really clever or funny commercials. But at the end of the commercial, it didn't make you want to take an action. It didn't make you want to buy their product. So in that sense, I would consider that advertisement a waste of money if it doesn't make you take an action. And maybe you could argue that some advertisements are for brand building, but I've seen some clever advertisements that don't really build up the brand or make you take an action. Or have you read a magazine advertisement and you didn't buy the product? You didn't think it was effective in making you buy the product? So this is another example of where an advertisement in writing might be really clever, but it still doesn't make you want to take an action. Or after reading an advertisement, have you ever told yourself, I'll think about it? And I'm sure we've all done this before. And the truth is, and this is what every copywriter knows, when someone tells you, I'll think about it, they're not going to think about it. You have to make the sale right now, or you have to make them take the action now. Otherwise, there is a large chance that they're never going to take the action at any other point. So now we're going to talk about benefits versus features. What are features? Well, features are what your product or service does. They're the physical characteristics of your product or service. And products or services usually have many features. So a lot of times you see this in product descriptions. You'll see the dimensions of a product or the material that it's made out of. And that's a feature. So what are benefits? Well, each feature helps your customer in some way. And how your feature benefits your customer is the benefit. Or uh, let me rephrase that. How each feature helps your customer is what you call the benefit. And the benefits are what your customers really care about. And essentially a benefit is how your product or service makes the lives of your customer better. So let's run through an example. Now here's a nice looking watch. And the features for this watch are a light leather strap, large numbers, and a 10 year battery life. So this is information about the watch, but it doesn't directly say how it benefits us. So let's translate these features into benefits. So now the benefit of the light leather strap is the light leather strap makes the watch very comfortable. That's the benefit. By purchasing this watch, it's going to be very comfortable because of that light leather strap. The large numbers, which was a feature, makes the watch easy to read. And that's the benefit. The watch is now easy to read because of the large number feature. Now for another example, remember that feature, the 10 year battery life? Well now we've translated that to a benefit. The 10 year battery life means you never have to worry about changing the battery. So as you can see, all of the benefits are underlined here. So the benefits include the feature, but they expand on the feature and they tell your customer how that feature is going to make their lives better. And this is really important that we include the benefits whenever we're selling a product or a service. And this gets back to customers caring about themselves. We want to let those customers know exactly how our product or service is going to benefit their life and make it easier or better. In this lecture, we're going to talk about the importance of being honest when you're writing copy. And the truth is, honesty sells. So I'm just going to use an example from your life. Let's say that you have two friends, and I'm sure you've experienced this. And one of the friends is really trustworthy. You really trust this friend. And there's another friend who always lies. He flakes out on you. So if they tell you the same thing, whose words mean more? The words from the friend you really trust or the words from someone that you know is always lying? And the answer, as you can imagine, is the trusted friend. You're going to value everything they say way more. And you might notice that the friends that seem to lie all the time always make these bold claims about how they're going to help you or who knows what. But you just know that they're lying, so you don't take anything they say seriously. 
So that's why when you're writing copy, trust is your most valuable asset. Because if your reader or customer doesn't trust you, then the words that you say are pointless. And customers can always tell when you're being honest. So let's play a quick game. I'm going to show you two different short pitches and tell me which one you think is more effective. So here's the first one. I have a new video course that will make you $10,000 in less than three months. It does not matter what experience you have had in the past. After taking this course, you will make thousands of dollars. So that's the first pitch. Now here's the second pitch. I'm going to be honest with you. After taking this course, you will not automatically make money. People in the past that have taken this course have made over $10,000, but it takes time and effort. So that's number two. So which one do you think is more effective? Now I'm guessing that you're thinking winner is number two. And that's because the second claim, even though it doesn't promise as much, it is much more believable. I actually believe that what this person is saying is true. And just like I mentioned before, if a customer does not trust you, then what you say is pointless. And going back to that first claim, I have a new video course that will make you $10,000 in less than three months. And it does not matter what experience you have had in the past. After taking this course, you'll make thousands of dollars. There's no way that's possible. So therefore, the first claim is not believable because no one can promise that kind of success. So that's a dramatic example, but even if it's less dramatic, if you're lying, then your customer can just sense it. Thank you for taking this course. I really hope you're enjoying it. And if you're getting a lot of value from the course, please take 15 seconds to leave an honest review. It really motivates me to make more courses in the future. And actually, I'll show you how you can leave a review in less than 15 seconds. So let's say you're taking this course right now. And in this example, I'm using a different course. In the top left-hand corner, you'll see the Back to Course tab. You can either click on that or right-click it and click on Open Link in a New Tab. And you're going to recognize this dashboard. Once you're in this dashboard, in the top right-hand corner, click on the Write a Review button and an option will come up and you can choose the number of stars that you think this course honestly deserves. And if that's all you want to do, that's really great. You can just click add review and you're done. Or if you'd like, you can enter your review title and add a short description of your review. So either way, I'd really appreciate it. It really does motivate me to make classes in the future. And that's it, you're done. So right now, please take 15 seconds and just pause this video and go leave an honest review if you're getting a lot of value from this course. Great, thank you. And if you don't feel like leaving a review right now, that's perfectly fine. I hope you continue to get value from this course and let's move on. In this video, I'm gonna tell you what a headline is, why they're so important, and the basics about what makes a headline effective. So first of all, Headlines are that short phrase or title at the beginning of your copy. So let's use some real world examples. If you're going to check your email inbox, every subject line is a headline. And what that headline is doing is it's saying, this is what you're gonna read if you read this email. And it's supposedly, or it's supposed to grab your attention. So if the headline's good and effective, it'll make you say, wow, I'm interested in the content of this email and I wanna read the rest of it. But if a headline's not effective, then you'll say to yourself, I don't need to read the rest of this email, I can just delete it. And headlines are not just subject lines, they're really any short phrase or sentence at the beginning of a piece of copy that's trying to get someone to read the rest of that copy. So some other examples are in a newspaper, the title of every article, is its own headline, and also books. The title of a book is another example of a headline. Now, the reason why headlines are so important is they grab your reader's attention. So the headlines are the thing about your copy that pops when your reader is scanning, and if they see something that piques their interest, then most likely they're gonna start reading the rest of your copy. And all headlines really have one single goal, 
And that single goal or purpose is to get the reader to read the first sentence of your copy. That's it. A headline's effective if you can get the reader to read your first sentence of the copy, and it's not effective if they decide that this copy's not for me, I'm gonna move on. And a great reason why headlines are so important is on average, five times as many people will read the headline than will read the body copy. So it's really important that your headline grabs your reader's attention. And that's why a lot of famous copywriters will spend a significantly longer time coming up with the headline than actually writing the rest of the copy. So we're going to talk about headlines in greater detail in the next couple of videos. But right now I just want to give you a big picture overview about what makes a good headline. And in a good headline, the benefit to the reader is very clear. The reader understands what benefit they're going to get when they read your copy. What also makes a good headline is the reader is interested and they want to learn more. So maybe having a strong benefit isn't going to work for your headline, but you can create curiosity in your reader. If your headline gets your reader curious, then they're going to want to read the first sentence of your copy and your headline was successful. And the last point I want to mention is I said the main purpose of a headline was to get your reader to read the first sentence of your copy. And that's true, but there is a slight caveat that I want to mention, and that is you don't want your reader to feel tricked once they start reading the first sentence of your copy. So for example, if your headline says, here's five tips to make you more money next month, and then all of a sudden they click on your copy and they're reading about something to do with coffee, that's just completely irrelevant, doesn't match the headline at all, well then they're going to feel tricked and the reader is going to get resentful and stop reading the rest of your copy. So just as an overview, the headline's goal is to get the reader to read the first sentence of your copy and to feel like they've made a good decision by reading that first sentence. They don't feel tricked by it. In this video, we're going to go into detail about creating a great headline. So there's this excellent copywriting book out there called Tested Advertising Methods. And it's really famous in the copywriting community. And one of the most important insights from that book is that there are three main principles that make headlines effective. And this is actually ranked in order of importance. So self-interest is by far the most important aspect that you can add to your headline to make it effective. And the second most important is news, followed by the third most important, curiosity. So news would be announcing a new product or service or announcing an update to an existing product or service. Whereas curiosity may be something that makes your reader want to read your body copy because it answers a strange question in the headline. And oftentimes you can combine two of these, but you don't have to include all three of them in every headline. And in fact, it's almost impossible, or it's at least really hard, to include all three effectively in a single headline. But you can include self-interest and curiosity in one. And an example of that would be, you're never going to believe this new writing secret that will make you a better writer. Now that's just off the top of my head, so I wouldn't use that, but hopefully you see where I'm going with this, where you can combine self-interest and curiosity. But as I mentioned, these are ranked in order of importance. So self-interest is the most effective. News is the second most effective, followed by curiosity. Now, self-interest, like we said earlier, is what benefit someone will get from your product or service. And that's really important. So if your reader reads your headline and they automatically identify the benefit that they'll receive from your copy or your product or service, then they're going to be interested, especially if it solves that pain point or problem that you know your reader is having. Another way you can include self-interest in your headline is to tell your reader how long it'll take for someone to get that benefit. So let's say you're writing a headline that says, how to become a more effective writer, or even better, how you will become a more effective writer. If you add in how you will become a more effective writer in less than two hours, then your reader might find that even more convincing. 
And this really depends on your product or service. So it can be something that's how to do X in less than a week. Now, obviously, if you're selling a product or service that's going to take a long time, you won't want to be how to do X in less than a couple years. But you just want to use your best judgment there. Another thing you can do to increase the self-interest in a headline is talk about what is holding your customer back from success. So let's say your customer has this desire to achieve some goal, but they haven't been able to over the years. If you can identify that thing that's holding them back, then you're much more likely to grab their attention because they will see that you can solve their problem. Then when it comes to news, an easy way to make a headline have a news element is to put announcing in the beginning of the headline. So the example I have here is announcing a new system for profiting on Amazon. Now it's important to be honest here and only use the news element if you're creating or have created a new product or service or an update to an existing one. But if you're selling the same product that you've been selling for a year, you don't want to include announcing or other news elements into your headline. Now the reason why news elements are so effective is because everyone loves to be the first to experience something. It's human nature. And finally, we have the curiosity appeal. And this is effective because humans are naturally curious. And it can be a really great way to get someone to read the first sentence of your copy. But as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, in the hierarchy of effectiveness, curiosity is third on the list, below news or self-interest. And for this reason, headlines that just appeal to your curiosity are not very effective. But if you couple a curiosity headline with a self-interest headline, or couple a curiosity headline with a news headline, then that can be very effective. So let's use the self-interest as an example. So now, not only will your reader become a better writer in two years, but let's say you said this, you won't believe this amazing secret that it makes you a more effective writer. So now I've created a headline that has self-interest, your reader will become a better writer, but also there's curiosity. What is this amazing secret he's discovered that will help me become a better writer? So adding curiosity to self-interest or news headlines can be really effective. In this lecture, I'm gonna go over three headline secrets that are gonna allow you to write way more effective headlines. And the first one is clarity over cleverness. So you always want to be clear in your copy. Your customers will not give your copy their full attention. And that's because, let's say they're browsing their email inbox, or if you was an ad in a newspaper, they're kind of half aware of what they're reading. It's not as if they're fully engaged in their email inbox. And you probably experienced this yourself, where you just casually browsing through emails, you might be listening to music. So for that reason, you want to be as clear as possible so your readers will understand what you're trying to say without giving all their mental energy. So for this reason, if you have to make someone think twice about your message, you're probably going to lose them. So here's an example of a clever headline, next time you'll get the check, versus announcing the benefit in a very clear way. Earn $200 more per month. And that's much more effective than the first one. The second important thing to keep in mind is always focus on the positive side of things. That's because people do not like to think about negative things. Now, you may know someone or a few people that always talk in a negative way, but when they're reading a headline that talks about a benefit they're going to get, they want it to be positive. They want to have something to look forward to. And almost anything can be framed in a positive way. So here's an example. The first one is avoid the trauma of a robbery. So let's say we're selling some kind of home alarm system. So that would be the negative side of that product. Avoid the trauma of a robbery. But you can also flip it to the positive side. Always keep your family safe. And if you're deciding between those two angles, go with the positive side. And lastly, and this is a very important point, sell the cure, not the prevention. And this really gets into human nature. 
people are much more likely to buy something that solves a problem they are having right now. They're much less likely to buy something that prevents something bad from happening in the future. Even if that possible bad event is really big, they're likely to put off the decision, say I'll think about it, and then they'll never buy your product. Whereas if they have a problem right now and you can solve it right now, you're much more likely to get their business. So an example here is a fire alarm is a hard product to sell. Let's, sell your, let's say you're selling a really advanced fire alarm. I don't know if they make those, but in this example, let's say they do. So you're selling a prevention. You might have a fire in the next couple of years, so I need you to buy this fire alarm now. That's a hard thing to do. That's a hard sell. But on the other hand, a product like Tylenol is an easy product to sell. So let's say you have a headache right now and you need to solve it. Well, if you have a headache and I have a box of Tylenol, it's really easy for me to sell you that Tylenol. And that's because you want relief from your pain or problem right now. And that's why I often refer to someone's problems as their pain points because that problem is causing them some kind of pain, whether it's mental pain or physical pain. And if you can help someone solve that problem, then they're gonna buy from you in an instant because you're giving them a cure to something that they're dealing with right now. So in this video, I'm gonna tell you exactly how you can write a great headline. Now before I get into this, I just wanna mention that you've been absorbing a lot of material in this course. And I know that's really great, but at the same time, you might be overwhelmed. You might think, oh, I don't know if I can write a headline now because I just might forget one of the principles he taught me, or I might forget most of them. And what I want to urge you to do is just brainstorm and write down the ideas that you have. And that's because the best way to get better at copywriting is to practice. And actually memorizing the lectures that I've given you is not going to help you that much. And that's because if you keep practicing, you're going to learn these techniques over time. But it's really important that you practice. So I'll give you two examples. One, let's say there's a person that just watches these, this video course over and over, writes down every single thing, but never practices writing copy. That person's first bit of copy is probably not going to be that good, even if they've memorized every lesson that I've taught in this course. But take for the second example, someone that's just been through this course once, but they keep practicing copy. They keep practicing writing headlines and writing body copy. Well, over time, they're going to be a really effective copywriter because they're practicing. So when it comes to writing a headline, create a list. And on this list, you just want to brainstorm headline ideas and write down anything that comes to your mind. And it's important that you don't judge the ideas that are coming out of your head. And just keep writing them down. And you're going to want to have at least 20 headlines. And once you've done this, do something else to get your mind off copywriting. Do an activity that you enjoy or a hobby. Then, wait until the next day and look at the list then. And see which headline sounds the best. And that's a great way to come up with an effective headline. Now again, I just want to reiterate that practice is so important. And the hardest time to start practicing is when you're just starting out. And because that's when the doubts are going to be filling your head. Because you haven't really done this for a while. But that's okay. Just keep writing and don't judge your ideas. And you will get better. And soon you'll become a very effective copywriter. Now... Let's say that you've done a lot of practicing, you feel somewhat comfortable writing headlines, but you really want to write an effective one for a project you're working on. Well, the best thing to do in this case is to do that process, like I mentioned, writing a list of headlines, but then pick three to five of your favorites and test them. And if you do this, you may be surprised by which headlines attract the most attention. And what's important is when you're testing is you want to try to keep other factors constant. So let's say that you're selling a Udemy course, for example, and you want to test different titles for your courses and see which one attracts more students. So let's say you test the first headline on Monday and Tuesday and the second headline on Wednesday and Thursday. 
Now, that's a good way to test, but it might give you strange results because Monday and Tuesday might be more popular days on Udemy than Wednesday and Thursday. So just using this Udemy example, you would want to test the first headline for a whole week and the second headline for the next week. And that's because you want to keep as many factors constant and only change the headline. That way you'll make sure that if the amount of people that look at your copy changes, it's because of that headline you changed and not because of something else. In this video, we're going to apply what we learned about headlines and take some look at real world examples on Amazon's Kindle store. Now to do this, we're going to look at books that come up when we search for home business. So every title of a book on the Amazon Kindle store is a headline. And that headline is either going to draw us in and make us read more about the book and possibly buy it, or push us to move towards looking at another book title. So let's take a look at these titles and see if we can apply what we've learned. So right here, home business, work at home, and make money from home. 50 jobs at home. So of our three elements, this one implies a self-interest which is you're going to work at home and make money from home by reading this book. And it also includes the curiosity element when it says 50 jobs at home. And already your reader's going to be curious, what are those 50 jobs at home that they can do to make money from their own house? Now I also noticed just as a side bit that they repeated home a lot. And I believe that's why it showed up as the number one result when I typed in home business. So that's just something I found interesting. But let's go on to the next title. 925 ideas to help you save money, get out of debt and retire a millionaire so you can leave your mark on the world. Wow. So if you thought you were using too much self-interest in a headline, just take a look at this one. Three different things that all directly to re relate to the reader. First one is 925 ideas to help you save money. That's a huge self-interest. Then look at the next one. Get out of debt and retire a millionaire. That's another piece of self-interest. And although that one doesn't directly say you, it is implied that they're talking about you being able to get out of debt and retire a millionaire. And then I just love this final bit of the headline. So you can leave your mark on the world. So much self-interest and especially with the 925 ideas, there's some curiosity in there as well. Now notice how these titles both seem really effective and the reviews reflect that. They're pretty popular books on the Kindle store. Then take a look at this next title, Home-Based Business for Dummies. And if we go through our three elements, there is no self-interest in this title whatsoever. There is no news element and there's not even a curiosity element. So this headline is not very effective. And it reflects that in the reviews. This is the third book to show up when we type in home business. And the amount of reviews it has is significantly lower than the amount of reviews of the two books above it and the book below it. And not to mention the book below that. So it doesn't fit in here. And that's because the headline is simply not an effective headline. It's not causing a lot of people to click on it and learn more. So it's amazing that a big company that you would think would know how to write great headlines after writing so many of these books actually doesn't have any self-interest in their headline. And you may say that they can't do it because they have to include four dummies, but they could easily include how to start your own home-based business or include a self-interest in some way without making the title too long. So then let's take a look at the next one, Craft Business Power. 15 days to a profitable online craft business. Now this one doesn't have as strong as a self-interest as it could have, but it still implies that you're going to be able to create a profitable online craft business. And it also has a really strong USP or unique selling proposition by telling you that you can create a profitable online craft business. And that's because none of these other books are talking about crafts. So if you're thinking that you want to start a craft business, this book is going to be very appealing. 
even though the self-interest isn't that great, the USP is strong if you're looking for a craft business. And then the next one here, how to make money online. Learn how to make money from home with my step-by-step -step plan to build a $5,000 per month, etc. So that actually could have a curiosity element simply because you can't read all the title until you click on it. But it also implies a self-interest. Learn how to make money from home, which is basically implying that learn how you can make money by home and you can use his step-by-step -step plan that's been successful for him. So that's another title that seems to be very effective because it includes a lot of self-interest, even though it's implied in this case. And compare that again with another generic title, Home Business Magazine. Notice how that's very similar to Home Based Business for Dummies. This title has no self-interest whatsoever, no news element, and no curiosity element. And the stars or reviews reflect that. Only 12, and in this case it just happens to be a very poorly rated publication. But it's just interesting to see that the titles make such a huge difference on the amount of people that read that book. Because if this title doesn't grab your attention, you're not going to click on it. And if you don't click on it and learn more, there's no way you're going to buy it. So headlines are extremely important. And there's so many different instances. And with the Kindle ebook titles, this is just one of many ways that headlines are used to make sales. In this video, you're going to learn about ADA. And once you learn about ADA, you're going to see it everywhere. And that's because it's a formula that's proven to work to get people to take action. And it's probably been used in letters that you've received at your home or on landing pages to websites. A lot of those use ADA. Or maybe in someone that gave you a sales pitch. They might have been following ADA. So this is an extremely powerful and effective formula for getting someone to take an action. And you're about to learn it. So ADA is your new best friend. And what ADA stands for is attention, interest, desire, action. And this is a formula that has been proven over time and time again to get people to take an action. So by attention, that's usually your headline. And that's to get someone interested in what you have to say. And then comes interest, which really builds up why should your customer be interested in what you're saying. Then it moves on to desire, which is where you have your customer imagine the benefit they will receive by taking this action. And finally, action. And in this stage, you want to tell your customer exactly what to do. So let's break up each of these in more detail. So attention is almost synonymous with the headline. And it really is what will grab your reader's attention. And just like the headline, how will you get your reader to read the first sentence of your copy? Now, the reason that attention is different than a headline is because ADA applies to more scenarios than just writing. So when you're talking to someone, you might grab their attention with a single sentence, and that starts you on the ADA track. Also, does your headline offer the promise of a benefit for your reader? And we went over that more in the headline section. So then, after you've got their attention, you want to get their interest. And their interest is why should your customer care about what you are saying? And in this part of the ADA formula, we want to capture the attention of our readers. And we can do this by identifying their problem. And there's a famous saying that if you can articulate the problem that your customer is having better than they can, then you already have their attention and you're going to make the sale. And it's all about truly identifying the problems that they're having. And this goes back to the customer interviews we talked about, where you understand your reader's pain points. Also, another way to capture interest is if you promise to share something with your reader. So you can tell your reader, in this copy, I'm going to explain to you something of value to them. Or you promise that if they keep reading, they'll find out more about how to get your product or service which will give them a benefit. So after attention and interest comes desire. And in the desire stage, we want to make it clear what problem you are solving for your customer. And we want to actually take it even a step further than that. And we want to help your reader visualize 
what their life will be like with your solution. And your solution is product or service. And in this stage, we want to use emotional copy to really make your reader feel what it's like to overcome their problem. And that leads me to a really important point, which is the difference between appealing to someone's emotions and appealing to someone's logic. And you've probably heard or experienced yourself that appealing to someone's emotions can be very powerful. And that's really true. But it's actually really important that we also appeal to their logic because that's how people justify their decisions. So if you use emotional copy to make someone want to buy your product or service or to take an action, then they're very likely to do it if they can justify why they're doing it. And most people can't justify something based on their emotions. They need a logical reason as to why they're doing it. And that's why you want to throw in both into what you're saying. So after desire comes action. And in this stage, you want to tell your customer exactly what step they should take next. And it may seem redundant, but you really want to tell them every single little step. And in that sense, you want to explain in great detail what they need to do. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be get more information, sign up for an email list, or buy your product or service. But what's important here is that you've outlined everything they need to do, and you've made it extremely clear how to do it. And this is because oftentimes we just assume that things are obvious and we take them for granted, but other people may not think that way. And that's why you want to spell out what they have to do. In this video, you're going to learn the difference between casual copy and institutional copy. Now, when I say institutional copy, I'm referring to the academic copy, which is kind of how you were taught in school. And it's also how a lot of businesses write. And it's making things more complex than they have to be. And in a way, it's kind of trying to impress others to make you look smarter. And it's just something that we've been picked up and kind of taught to write that way, but it really actually goes against us. And I really think it all comes back to how you learn to write in school. So if you look at how we were incentivized, and it doesn't matter how long ago you went to school, but when you were in school, you learned to make a certain page count or a word count, and you wanted to fill up the space and also use big words to impress your teacher and to get a good grade. And the thing is, if you learn that way, no matter how long ago, if you don't learn any differently, you're going to write like that your entire life. And this causes us to make things more complicated than they need to be. But when you're writing copy, you really want to write in a casual way. And in this sense, you should write like you talk. And if you remember from our earlier persona video, your writing is a conversation with a single reader. And that's why when you write your copy, you should use the simplest language possible to get your point across. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the importance of getting started and the power of editing. So when you're just starting to write a piece of copy, you might see that white screen. And I'm talking about that blank Word document with nothing on it. And that can be really intimidating. And this is also known as writer's block. And not only is this common whenever you're starting a new piece of copy, but if you haven't done much copywriting or a lot of writing in the past, then this white screen is going to be even more intimidating. And the reason it's intimidating is because we don't want to write the wrong thing. We have all these thoughts going on in our head, and we want to say it in a way that's effective, but we're afraid of saying the wrong things. And the way to overcome this white screen challenge is to simply get started. Just get something on the page. And the best way to do this is just to hear your thoughts and transfer them onto the paper or your Word document without judgment. Just let every thought writ become written and don't put any filters on it. And this is a great way to really just get your ideas on the page. And it doesn't matter if it doesn't flow well. The important thing is you're getting those ideas out of your head and onto the paper. And keep in mind with this first draft, no one is going to read this except for you. So you don't have to worry about being embarrassed or it not being perfect. And it's actually probably going to be really sloppy and that's okay because you're just getting those thoughts on paper. 
And after you do that, then you can spend a lot of time editing. And editing is where the magic happens. It's where your copy comes to life. And depending on the length of your copy, you'll most likely rewrite it from five to 10 times. And that's because each time you go through your copy and you edit it, it becomes stronger and more effective. And the best way to edit your copy is to print out a piece or a copy of <laughs> a copy of your copy. You want to print it out and read it out loud. And this way you can see if the words flow, if the structure makes sense, and if you're using good words that are easy to follow and not overly complicated. And you can do that multiple times. So you print out your copy, read it out loud, make changes with a pen, then input those changes into your Word document, print it again, and repeat that process. And if you do that multiple times, you're going to have a really strong and effective piece of copy. But the important thing here is that you got started and you did that initial first draft with just a brain dump with all your thoughts and you put it on paper. Now we're going to talk about the importance of anticipating your customer's doubts. And it's really important that we address the doubts your customer has in the body copy. Now, keep in mind, no product or service is perfect. Almost all products or services have some flaws. So when you're writing your copy, you want to avoid the magic pill mentality. And the magic pill is if you buy my product or service, your life is going to instantly get better without any work on your part. And in most cases, that's simply not true. And if you write from the magic pill mentality, then you're not being honest. So it's much better to address these flaws that your product or service has. Because whether or not you address them doesn't stop the customer from having their doubts. So if you can bring up their doubts for them, then you're going to build a lot more trust. And even if your product or service happens to be perfect, your customer will still have doubts. And there's actually a lot of examples of this where famous copywriters had a product that just was so good that people wouldn't believe it was that good, so they wouldn't buy it. So the copywriter actually had to talk down the product. And that just shows you the power of bringing up these flaws. So like I said, don't pretend your product or service is flawless. And when you bring up the flaws or the doubts your customer's having, you are building trust. And as I mentioned in a previous video, trust is the most important thing you have when you're writing your copy. And that's because just like the difference between your best friend that you can trust and a friend that always lies, if your reader trusts you, then your words are way more meaningful to them. And if your reader does trust you, then your words are almost pointless. And they're probably just going to walk away without reading any more of your copy. So trust helps sell your product. And remember, without trust, your words do not matter. Now I'm going to talk about the two readership paths in your body copy. So with your body copy, there are two types of readers. There are the quick readers who just want to browse the subheadlines and they want to get a general idea about what you're saying. And there's the long readers who are going to read every word on your page. And it's important that you cater to both of these readers. And that's because each makes up about half of the people that are going to look at your body copy. So quick readers either don't have the time or the interest in reading all of your copy, but they want to quickly understand your message. And after reading the sublines, sub headlines, they're going to decide if they want to invest more time into your copy. Only then if the story intrigues them, then they're going to take the time to really read your entire copy. And that's opposed to the long readers. And these are the people that will just start from the beginning of your copy and they're going to read all of it. And they find your copy interesting or helpful. Otherwise, they would not be reading it. And these are the type of people that are more likely to purchase your product or service. So if you write effective subheadlines, you want to convert your quick readers into long readers. So here's an example. The subheadlines ask locals to save money and safety is important are tailored for the quick readers. 
Those are the people that are not going to read the body text, but I want to give them a gist of what this copy is about. So under the ask locals to save money, that whole paragraph could be summed up in that sub headline on top. Same with the paragraph below safety is important. In that longer paragraph, the essential message I'm saying is safety is important. So it's important to have these subheadlines throughout your body copy that sum up each section of what you're saying. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how long should your copy be. And this is actually a very common question that's asked all the time. And the truth is, there is no one right answer. And the thing is, length of your copy actually does not matter. What does matter is that you cover the essentials of your message without including any unnecessary information. So it's commonly said that copy is like a woman's skirt. It should be long enough to cover the essentials, but short enough to keep it interesting. And that's actually a pretty good way of summarizing it. So I don't know if that resonates with you or not. But the point is, we want to make sure that we cover all the points that will convince our reader to take an action, but we also don't want to bore them with irrelevant information. So if you're selling a simple product, like a water bottle, then you probably don't need that much copy. But if you're selling an investment kit, where it takes more convincing to get the reader to take an action, then you're going to need to have longer copy, just by the nature of the product you're selling. Now, a general rule of thumb is readership falls off dramatically in the first 50 words of your copy, but after that, readership stays the same up to 500 to 1,000 words. So what that means is you're going to have some people that are just going to read the first couple of words and stop, but after that, it really doesn't matter how long your copy is. In most cases, your reader is going to keep reading your copy. And actually, some sales pages are over 8 pages long, and they're still really effective. So it's just really important that you're covering the essentials, but also keeping it interesting and not too long. But other than that, don't worry about the length of your copy. It really doesn't make that big of a difference. In this video, I'm going to be talking about text decoration. And text decoration is a great way to make your copy easier to read and in many cases more interesting. So there are many ways to make your text more interesting to read. You can bold certain words, italicize words, put words in all caps, or underline words. And not only does this add emphasis to certain words in your copy, but it also just makes it more approachable if your audience wants to read it. And it makes it look more fun and engaging. But it's really important that you keep in mind your audience. So if you were selling something in a business to business market, you might not want to use too much text decoration. And that's because it might make you perceived as less professional. But if you were sending an email to a friend or a casual audience, then using some forms of text decoration is probably going to make your copy more interesting to read. So I like to use these techniques in emails all the time. Another thing that's important to consider is you want to choose fonts that are easy to read. And this actually goes back to a much earlier lecture in the headlines, and it's the difference between being clear and being clever. And in this case, it's the difference between having a clear font that's easy to read or a decorative font that might look better, but it's harder for our customer to read. And when it comes down to those choices, we always want to choose a font that's easy to read. That's because we don't want to put any extra pressure or effort on our reader in order to read our copy. Another thing you want to do is take advantage of spacing to make your text easier to read. And by spacing, I mean the white space that you can see in between this text. So with these three bullet points, I could have turned them into one paragraph, but instead I've used white space here to separate them out. And that makes it much more easy for you to understand the message that I'm trying to communicate. Another thing that's really important is the text size should be consistent. And that's for the body copy. It doesn't matter if the header's a different size. 
But in this example, you can see that these three bullet points are all the same text size. And if one of these bullet points was larger than the other two, then it would be very confusing and it would really look unpleasant to your reader. But by having them all be the same font size, then it's much easier to read and the information is communicated more clearly. But as you can see, the headline is a larger size and that's perfectly fine. Another thing you want to keep in mind is you want to avoid blocks of text. So right here, I have a huge chunk of text and it just looks intimidating. It doesn't make me want to read it at all. But if you compare that with more organized text, then it's clear that I would much rather read this text in this format as opposed to this long chunk of text. And that's because this chunk just looks like a lot of work. And it looks like it would take a lot of effort to read. Whereas these smaller paragraphs with subheadings above them looks much more approachable. And this also serves two purposes because it also helps us appeal to the two readership paths, the quick readers that read the subheadlines and the long readers that read all the text. So now I want to talk about text alignment. And there's three different types of alignment. There's center alignment, where there's an invisible line that goes through your text, and your text is evenly distributed on both sides. Then there's left alignment, where there's an invisible line to the left of your text, and all your text is pushed up against it. And there's right alignment, where there's an invisible line to the right, and all your text is pushed up against that. So center alignment works really well for headers but it doesn't work well for your body copy. And actually, if you center align your body copy, it looks very disorganized and it's much harder for your reader to read. So most of the time, you want to align your text to the left. And that's because it makes it much easier to read and it's more pleasing to the eye. And occasionally, you might want to align your text to the right, but it's very unlikely that you'll want to. And the only time I could think that you would want to align your text to the right is for report covers. You might want to put your name in the right instead of the left. So center alignment works really well for headers, but for the body copy, you almost always want to left align it. And these two examples are both left aligned. So imagine there is an invisible line here and all the text, as you can see, is pushed up against that invisible line. And same with this other chunk of text over here. There's that invisible line that all the text is pushed up against. And lastly, if you have a very casual audience, you can have fun using some text symbols. And these can be really fun to use, but it's very important that if you're communicating to a professional audience that you don't use these because they can be seen as silly. So you can use these, I was blown away. Or you can use per periods to make a pyramid and build up to your main point. And of course, you always have the smileys that you can add in there. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about the importance of using correct grammar in your copy. And it's really important because spelling or grammar errors are very distracting. If the person reading your copy sees these errors, it really makes them lose credibility with you. And that's because it shows that you didn't take it seriously and that reflects poorly on the message you're trying to communicate. So if you have one or two mistakes, it's not the end of the world, but it's really important that you try to get rid of as many of them as possible. And the best way to get rid of grammar mistakes is simply to reread your copy out loud. And that's because when you reread it out loud, if you have a grammar mistake, it's going to sound funny when you say it and you can catch it right there. And it's actually even more effective if you have access to a printer because then you can print a hard copy and not only are you more likely to catch errors if you're reading it on an actual piece of paper, but then you can combine that with rereading it out loud and that'll make you more likely to find grammar or spelling errors. And then of course you always have another option which is to have someone else read your copy. And I believe this is the best way to catch your spelling or grammar mistakes. And that's because if you've been working with a piece of copy for a while and you've written multiple 
versions of it and you've made a lot of edits, you kind of get used to seeing the same words and it causes you to overlook your spelling or grammar errors. But if you bring an outside person with a fresh perspective and you allow them to look over your copy, they're much more likely to catch the spelling or grammar errors that you missed. Congratulations on making it through this course. Now we're going to take some time and review everything that we've learned. So we started off by talking about why learn copywriting. And the answer was you can apply copywriting everywhere. And it really helps you develop a customer focused mindset. So you'll remember that main idea, which is customers don't care about you, they care about themselves. And by learning copywriting, we truly understand that. And we learn how to best tailor our writing and our mindset to solve our customers' problems. Another great reason to learn copywriting is you only have to write it once and you're done. So it's like delivering your best sales pitch thousands of times. And with the power of the internet, this is something that we didn't have only 10, 15 years ago. So this is one of the most amazing times to really use the skill of copywriting. And another reason is there is a huge demand for people with copywriting skills, both in the business to consumer market, as well as the business to business market. Then we talked about the philosophy of copywriting. And the main points were the goal of your copy is to get your customer or reader to take an action. And it doesn't matter what that action is, but it's important that everything that we write is slowly or quickly convincing them to take that action. Another thing we talked about is the importance of using benefits and not just features. So features describes your product, but benefits tell your reader how those features make their life better. And that's what your reader really cares about. We also talked about the importance of always being honest. And that's because when you're honest in your copy, you build trust. And when you have trust with your reader, then your reader takes your words more seriously. We also talked about how customers only care about themselves and they don't care about you. They don't care who's writing the copy. They want to know if you can help them solve their problems. Another important thing is to always get to know your customer first. And the best way to do this is to interview them. And if you interview them and just really sit back and listen to what they're saying, you're going to pick up on their pain points. And if you know their pain points, then you can write really effective copy that speaks directly to them. We then talked about the central selling idea, and that's the single offer that you're communicating to your reader. So it doesn't matter what your offer is, as long as it's very clear to you and you can communicate it clearly to your customer. So let's say your central selling idea is if they give you their email, then you'll give them a free ebook. That's your offer. And no matter how great your copy is, if your offer is really bad, then no one's going to take you up on your offer. So it's really important that you have an offer that's enticing for your reader. And finally, always talk to one person. And a great way to make sure you're doing that is to create a persona based off your customer interviews. And when you're writing, just keep that persona in your mind. And keep in mind that persona was a fictional character that we made based on what we believe our target market is. So after the philosophy of copywriting, we moved on to headlines. And headlines are extremely important because they grab attention. And without an effective headline, your body copy is pointless. So keep in mind that statistic that five times as many people read your headline as will read your body copy. And most professional copywriters spend more time writing a great headline than they do writing the entire body copy. Then we talked about what tested advertising methods taught about great headlines. And that is effective headlines have one or more of these three elements. And the first of these elements, which is the most effective, is self-interest. And that is followed by news, which is the second most effective element. And finally, curiosity. And we also talked about 
how the best couplings of these principles are usually self-interest and curiosity or news and curiosity. If you can include either of those combinations in your headlines, you are much more likely to grab your reader's attention. We also talked about the importance of having a clear headline and how that's much more effective than using clever headlines that are confusing. We want to spell out the benefit that our customer is going to get by reading our copy. We also want to focus on the positive outcome. So almost anything can be framed in either a negative or a positive way, and it's very important that we highlight the positive side of that. And finally, it's much more effective if you offer a cure for an existing problem, like Tylenol for a headache, than preventing a future problem, which is a fire alarm which might prevent a fire in the future. So if you can cure an existing problem and mention that in your headline, you're much more likely to get attention. Then we talked about your body copy, and we started with ADA, which is your new best friend. And ADA stands for attention. How are you grabbing the attention of your reader? And that's usually a headline. Then interest, which is why should your reader be interested in what you have to say? Then we moved on to desire, which is having your reader imagine what it's like if they take the action that you're suggesting. And we talked about in your desire, you want to use a lot of emotional copy, but also balance it out with logical copy. And finally, we talked about action. And this is where you want to spell out exactly what you want your reader to do. After that, we talked about the difference between casual and institutional copy. And casual copy is where you write like you speak, whereas institutional copy is where we use big words to sound smart, and it's really just overcomplicating things. So you always want to use casual copy. Now, the level of how casual you are will depend on your setting. So if you're writing business to business, you don't want to be super casual, but you still want to communicate your message in simple words and not use overly complicated words for the sake of sounding smart. Then we also talked about the importance of writing something. And then after you write anything and get your ideas on paper, then you could take advantage of the power of editing and edit your paper multiple times. After that, we talked about the importance of anticipating your customer's doubts in your copy and bringing them up. And when you do that, you build a lot of trust with your reader. And lastly, we talked about the importance of having two readership paths. And that's one path for your quick readers who are just going to scan the sub headlines and they want to get a general idea of what you're saying and the long readers who are going to read all your body copy. And then we moved on to the technical copy. And the technical copy is just more information about how to write effective copy. So what we talked about is your copy should be just long enough. That's long enough to cover all the main points to convince your reader to take an action, but not so long that we bore the reader or we include any unnecessary information. Then we talked about how you can use text decorations to make your copy more engaging and interesting, but it really depends on your audience. And finally, we talked about the importance of rereading your copy out loud to find your grammar mistakes. And if you can get someone else to read your copy for you, then that's an even better way to catch your mistakes. As we come to the end of this course, I really want to emphasize the importance of practicing. So this course is an excellent start to make you a great copywriter, but you really have to keep practicing. And that's because practicing is the single way that you're actually going to take these lessons and internalize them and turn it into great copy. And you can practice with any form of writing where you're trying to make someone take an action. So even with most of your emails, practice some of these principles that you learn in this course and just keep trying to write copy in any way you can. And examples where you can practice copywriting are emails, your personal blog if you have one, or you can start one. And an example of an action you can have your reader take in your blog is sign up for an email list. And you can have a website. And if you have a website, you can practice your copywriting there. Or you can practice your copywriting if you're selling any type of product, or even in conversation. 
So let's say you and a group of friends are deciding on which movie to go to. Try using a little bit of Ada. See if it works. Now, the most effective way to practice copywriting, and this is actually recommended by almost all of the famous copywriters, is to use a pen and a paper and spend 10 minutes of day hand copying famous sales letters. And I know this sounds kind of crazy, but it really helps you internalize what good copy sounds like, and you'll subconsciously write better copy if you do this. And it only takes 10 minutes a day, so I'd highly recommend it. So in this course description, I'm gonna include a Dropbox link with five famous sales letters that you can start copying right now.